so good afternoon everyone thank you so much for being here for the fall 2016 distinguished lecture part of the dr melvin l de fleur distinguished lecture series um, sponsored by the communication research center here at boston university i'm Ina tai vogel i'm one of the co-directors along with dr jim cummings and we're very excited today and it's our greatest honor to present dr isaac eisen professor of psychology emeritus from the university of massachusetts amherst Dr. Eisen's work is most notable um, looking at the relationship between um, verbal attitudes and overt behaviors, developing theories such as the theory of reasoned action and theory of planned behavior. Along with these areas uh, of work that he's um, focused on, um, he's also interested in other avenues such as looking at automatic and habitual versus reasoned um, behaviors, as well as information accuracy and knowledge. Please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Isaac Eisen. Thank you, Mina, uh, and thank you for the invitation to speak to you here today. Um, it's been uh, quite a night uh, last night. Um, the, um, I think um, Donald Trump put up quite a show for us, uh, a lot of uh, surprises. Um, I think the ratings went through the roof, and um, I must say that, um, that Donald uh, knows a thing or two about persuasion. So we'll, I cannot match Donald Trump in that respect, but I, what, I, what I'd like to do today is to tell you a bit about, some, I'd give you some ideas about how to design an effective behavior change intervention based on my theory of planned behavior. About uh, three years ago, Australia passed a law that requires uh, tobacco products to be packaged in plain packaging. The, um, up until that act uh, that was in, uh, passed, cigarette packs sold in Australia and look like this. It's the front of the pack. Uh, you can see that there is 30% uh, of the top of the pack is a rather repelling graphic health warning. And then 70% uh, of the pack is devoted to brand imagery, the trademark. Um, the law required a change in the packaging and the cigarettes are now sold in a pack like this. Which, um, where, where the graphic health warning was enlarged to cover 70% of the front, or 75%, I believe, and 25% is left over for just plain information about the brand and the variant in um, a very plain um, font and very drab, the whole package is in drab colors. Now, um, as you may imagine, the uh, tobacco producers and the tobacco companies were not amused. And so they uh, challenged this law. Uh, they went to the World Trade Organization. They didn't really have any problem with the enlarged graphic health warnings or with the drab colorists, but they claimed that uh, this was an infringement of their trademark and the trademark is protected under international agreements. And so they wanted to be able to put their trademark on the pack, something like this. Um, Australia, though, argued that that uh, would uh, undermine what they were trying to do as part of the, the uh, tobacco control efforts. So it went before the, the World Trade Organization. Now, uh, Australia didn't really have a well-developed theory to, um, that, that, that they had used to design this intervention. Rather, they figured as follows. They said, if you make these packages plain, then uh, that will reduce the appeal of the pack itself, of course, and by extension, the appeal of tobacco products. It will increase the effectiveness of the health warnings. For one thing, they're, they're now enlarged. 
but also they figured that these uh, the graphic imagery from the, the uh, brand imagery, that that somehow has some positive connotations and interferes with the processing of the inf health information. And also they thought that the graphic imagery, the brand imagery, it was deceptive in leading people to believe that the cigarettes uh, were less dangerous than they really are. And so uh, by introducing plain packaging, they thought it would reduce the appeal of tobacco products and increase the effectiveness of the graphic health warnings. And as a result of that, they figured that uh, they would get change in smoking behavior. So it would inhibit initiation among young people, it would reduce consumption among smokers, it would promote quitting and discourage relapse among people who try to quit. Well, I was brought in as an uh, expert consultant to try to evaluate this approach and um, later on the uh, results, the effects of this intervention. And I had sort of uh, some concerns about this. I wasn't sure that this was really going to work. And the reason I thought it was unlikely to have much of an effect is that, for one thing, people generally are quite well familiar with the harmful effects of smoking. I mean, the, you get that in health education courses, you get it in public service announcements, you have the warnings on the cigarette packs, and people know that smoking is bad for them. And nothing new was being communicated here except to make this health warning larger. Um, also, I felt that the attitude being addressed, the attitude here being the appeal of the pack and of tobacco products, was the wrong attitude. Um, that, um, and we'll try, I'll try to show later that the, the really more important attitude was the, the attitude towards smoking. Do you, uh, you know, what do you think about smoking, not what do you think about the pack in which the cigarettes come? And uh, also, we know that among smokers, the vast majority intend to quit. So it's not, it's not really a question of persuading them it's bad for them and they should quit. They already intend to quit. So what is this change in the packaging going to do in terms of helping them carry out their intentions. There's nothing in this, in this plain packaging law that would provide people with the means to carry out their intentions to quit. Now to uh, Australia's credit, they uh, decided to collect data uh, to study the impact of this change in packaging. They commissioned a survey a National Plain Packaging Tracking Survey. Um, in that survey, they uh, called up uh, adult smokers uh, six months prior to the implementation of this law and then one year afterwards. And every month, about 200 people were interviewed by telephone and they were asked all kinds of questions about their beliefs concerning cigarettes and smoking, as well as their reports of their sm actual smoking behavior. You can see that uh, you know, over these months uh, they collected a lot of data, so we have a large samples, and if there is an effect, we should, we should see it. It uh, you know, should come out significant. So uh, here are the, some of the questions that they asked to get at the appeal of the pack of the tobacco products. Uh, I like the look of my pack compared to a year ago. How, how would you rate the, the appeal of your pack? So people did, in fact, rate this package as being much less appealing. Not surprisingly, it really is pretty ugly. Um, they also had uh, some effects, not quite as strong if you look at the uh, effect size. The effect size is strong for the pack. It's much weaker for tobacco products, the quality of the product, satisfaction with the product, the value for money, but they still, these effects are significant. So, you would think, all right, they have, they have obtained their, their, their objective of making this, this pack really unappealing 
and tobacco products also less appealing. Now then, there were a bunch of questions on the survey that had to do with the with behaviors related to smoking. Um, here are some uh, of these behaviors during past week. How often have you thought about quitting? How often did you stop when you had an urge? How often, um, how important is quitting to you? How many cigarettes smoke per day? Have you made more than one quit attempt? And, how, and if you made a quit attempt, uh, how many days uh, before you started smoking again? And what you can see is that there was not a single significant effect. So one, on the one hand, the appeal did become much more, I mean, the cigarettes pack and, and, and tobacco products became less appealing, the attitudes became more negative, yet the behavior didn't change. And this is not inconsistent with what we know about the relation between attitudes and behavior. General attitudes towards objects, such as the cigarette pack or tobacco products, are, not, are found to be rather poor predictors, usually, of specific behaviors. And that's why I was skeptical that we would get anything here. Now, another way to look at this behavior is to just see it, uh, the prevalence of smoking in Australia. The, um, that's simply the, the percent of people who report that they smoke. And you can see that there is a steady decline in smoking over the years. This is similar in most developed countries. Smoking has been going down for a number of reasons. Uh, it was educational. The price of cigarettes has been going up because of taxes. Uh, more recently, there are young people are switching to e-cigarettes. I mean, all kinds of reasons why tobacco smoking is going down. <coughs> Question, though, is did the plain packaging make a difference? This is where plain packaging was introduced, and there's no discernible effect in terms of prevalence of smoking. You can apply various statistical models to this, and, but basically there is nothing there. So what happened? Well, we can look at the association, correlation between <coughs> the measures of appeal and these behavior, smoking behaviors. I just pulled out here, there are six times uh, six, I guess. Oh, this is uh, five times six, 30 associations. There were a total of 130 such associations that you com could compute on those data. Um, of the 130, only one was statistically significant. That's by chance alone, presumably. It's this one, and it's in the opposite direction of what you would expect. These are odds ratios, so a value above one means it's, a it's a, an association in the expected direction. So the, the less the appeal, the less you smoke. Um, if it is below one and it's the opposite direction, the lower the appeal, the more you smoke. And so here we have a significant cor correlation or association, <laughs> but it's, it's in the opposite direction. In any event, it's just one of very many associated. And basically, the, these attitudes that they were changing with the uh, redesigned package, these attitudes were unrelated to behavior. And so if you change these attitudes, as they did, they wouldn't get a change in behavior. And they didn't. Um, they said before, maybe the more relevant attitude would be attitude towards smoking. Now, they didn't actually have a direct measure of attitude towards smoking in this survey. <clears throat> but they did have a couple of questions that came close to it. These are questions about uh, enjoyment. How, how often have you thought uh, about enjoy the enjoyment of smoking? And uh, how concerned are you that smoking may affect your health? And you can see that these measures show no effect at all of the intervention. So the, the point I'm trying to make is that if you're going to change attitudes, and it's a very common strategy that people use when they try to change behavior, but if we're going to change attitudes, we have to change the right, the right attitude, the attitude that's relevant to the behavior that we're interested in. What about the effectiveness of these graphic health warnings? This turns out that there were no effects. We asked the, 
Do you think that the danger of smoking has been exaggerated? Uh, smokers get lung cancer only in old age. Don't compare to a year ago. So when people were asked to evaluate the harmfulness of smoking, there's no effect due to the plain packaging. And then again, of course, if that, if these kinds of beliefs haven't changed, then you wouldn't expect a change in behavior either. So I think one of the reasons I said before that they didn't get much change is because people were already familiar with the, with the uh, dangers of smoking. You didn't need to have it, you know, the picture enlarged to, to explain to them that smoking was bad. Now, the, if you look at behavior change interventions, the strategies that are used typically address two things, the attitudes, as I mentioned before, and information, in other words, knowledge that people have. The, the idea there being that to uh, act in a reasonable way, you have to be well informed. And so a lot of interventions basically provide people with information uh, to educate them about the issues involved. Now, even when people do when these, when these interventions are effective and people do acquire the information that's being presented, it often doesn't have much of an effect. Let me show you here another study. This is in a very different context. This is uh, a health education program to prevent HIV AIDS done in Nigeria with high school students. The behavior they were trying to change to influence was uh, consistent use of condoms. And so they measured to add, to add people report whether they used condoms before the intervention and after the intervention. The intervention itself consisted of a six-week program of education where they had uh, sessions where the, the students were told about transmission prevention of AIDS. It was done in lectures, uh, role-playing, stories, debates, and so on. And then there was a control group that didn't get this intervention. And what we can see here is that in the, this is a control group, knowledge did, did not increase. Of course, they weren't exposed to anything. Um, but in the intervention group, the uh, knowledge, if you look pre-intervention to post-intervention, they did uh, learn quite a bit in that uh, course, in that health education course about HIV and its prevention. Then we can look at the behavior had no change in behavior in the control group, but there was also no change of behavior in the experimental group. So now we have people who actually have learned something new about HIV AIDS, yet their behavior didn't change. Now there are a number of reasons why uh, knowledge by itself often does not really produce the behavior we, we're interested in. Um, and I, I don't have the time to go into that. But there's one thing I'd, I'd like to show you. The um, particular knowledge that's being conveyed to people may not be relevant to the behavior we're interested in. I'll give you an example. Say, knowledge about HIV AIDS. AIDS is not spread by mosquitoes. Now, maybe I didn't know that. And now if I learned that it's not spread by mosquitoes. Okay, what, what is the behavioral implication of it? And then she knew the comma. I mean, what is the relevance of that piece of information, right? But that's what, what a lot of these health education programs do. They provide information that may be largely irrelevant. Or if you have environmental knowledge, what if you learn that polar ice caps melted completely, sea levels would rise approximately four to five inches? That means you should use public transportation. What exactly are we trying to suggest to them? So this is in the case of attitudes. If we want to change behavior, we have to address the right behavior-relevant attitude. When we provide knowledge to people, when we try to change the, the information they have, the beliefs that they, they form, we have to address the right kinds of beliefs. Now to um, know, that's what I'm saying, that you know, we have to address the right kinds of added beliefs and attitudes, but what are the right kinds of beliefs and attitudes? How do we know? What we need is some kind of a theoretical framework, some kind of a, a, a basic understanding of the processes. See, 
it, it, I, always, I find it amazing sometimes to look at interventions and how they're designed in a rather sort of haphazard way without much advanced planning, understanding of the process. We would never go about doing that, say, if we were um, trying to develop a treatment for disease, for example, maybe a, a new medication. No, we would first do some research to try and understand the, the, the processes involved in the disease, what exactly is happening. Uh, we would then try to figure out how we can prevent these kinds of processes or st stop them or change them. We would then uh, uh, look at means that, that how that can be done. We might then try it out on, uh, in, the, in the laboratory, maybe in the dish, to see if the, the cells change in the way that we predict that they would change. And we then might try it out on some animal models, and then maybe with, uh, finally, after some years of research, we might get permission to actually try it out on a few uh, volunteers. Right? A lot of preparation goes into this. When it comes to behavior change, yeah. We all, I mean, we all know behavior, right? So it's not a big deal. We know how to, to influence behavior. We have some sense of it, whether it's using condoms or it's uh, smoking cigarettes. We have a basic understanding, and so we make up some intervention. We try it out. Well, you know, if it's a small-scale intervention, that's fine. You see if it works or it doesn't. But sometimes these interventions are quite costly. They're large-scale. They involve preparation of videos and you know, advertising and buying buying time on television and so on. So they can be costly, time-consuming, yet very little planning goes into them. Now, if we, have a, if we had a, a kind of some theory that tells us what is likely to work, uh, how we might collect the data to understand what is happening and how we could change behavior, that would be very useful, right? And so a few years ago, uh, Webb and his associates did a meta-analysis of internet-based uh, behavior change interventions. These interventions targeted physical activity, dieting, alcohol consumption, smoke, smoking abstinence, and they found some uh, 85 interventions total. Of these 85, the majority were not based on any kind of theoretical model. Uh, the, re the remainder were based on some theory, and the theories that uh, most, were most frequently used was uh, Bandura's social cognitive theory, Prochaska and De Clementi's trans theoretical model, and the theory of planned behavior. Now, the first thing they found is that those studies, those interventions that were based on a theoretical model, were more effective. They produced larger effect sizes than the interventions that were not based on some theory. And those that were based on the theory, <coughs> those that were based on the theory of planned behavior were the most effective of all those, the three. So what is this theory of planned behavior? How can it be used to, uh, to design interventions? Now I understand that many of you are familiar with the theory, so I'll just to remind you uh, very quickly, the theory plant behavior starts with the behavior we're trying to predict, understand, and maybe change. Um, according to the theory, the immediate antecedent of behavior is the intention to engage in the behavior. But of course we know that people don't always carry out their intentions. There are any number of reasons why people may not uh, follow through. Uh, built into the theory is one factor that can interfere and that is the degree of control that people have over behavioral performance. So if you, uh, if you have the skills, the, the, the abilities, cooperation from other people, time, money, whatever it takes to perform the behavior, if you have these resources, then you'll be able to carry out your intention. There should be a strong effect of intention on behavior. But if you lack some of these, then you may not be able to carry out your intention. There's a moderating effect here. Um, next question, where do the intentions come from? How do people form an intention to engage or not engage in the behavior? And according to the theory, there are three kinds of considerations that go into this. One has to do with the perceived consequences of behavior. To the extent that the consequences are perceived to be predominantly positive, 
person will develop a positive attitude towards performing the behavior. But if you believe that performing the behavior will lead to many negative outcomes, you'll form a negative attitude towards the behavior. And that then influences the attention. The second kind of consideration has to do with the influence of other people, social norms. Your normative beliefs, beliefs about what other people think I should do, whether I should or should not perform the behavior, as well as what I see other people are doing. Uh, so these are injunctive normative beliefs and descriptive normative beliefs. Together, they produce a sense of subjective, of, 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 of social pressure. I, I can perceive social pressure to engage and not engage in the behavior, which we call the subjective norm. And the third type of consideration has to do with these control issues that I mentioned before, <laughs> whether I believe that I have the skills, abilities, time, money, and so on, that it would take to perform the behavior. In their totality, these control beliefs produce a sense of perceived behavioral control, or what Bandura called self-efficacy. Perceived behavioral control and self-efficacy are basically equivalent, theoretically, although they're usually assessed in different ways. Now, in many applications of the model, we don't really know what level of control uh, objectively is present in the situation. To what extent people do have all the, uh, everything it takes to perform the behavior. Um, but we do have a measure of perceived control. And to the extent that perceived behavioral control reflects the actual control reasonably well, to the extent it's, it's accurate, we can use perceived control as a proxy for actual control to help us understand the effect of an intention on behavior. Okay, that's the theory. So one other th aspect uh, to it, which is sort of the more the dynamic feature, once you perform the behavior, or try to perform it, because you uh, obtain feedback, you learn that some of the consequences you anticipated don't occur. And maybe there's some unanticipated consequences you didn't didn't know would happen, that would change your behavioral beliefs and your attitude, and that would influence your future intention. You may also learn that people don't, uh, you know, that what you thought people expected of you is not what it, what it is, that they react negatively to what you're doing, or positively, as the case may be. And again, that would influence your subjective norm, perceived social pressure, and then your intention. And you may also find out that you do or don't have certain kinds of skills that you need to perform the behavior, and that would change your, your perceived behavioral control. So there is a sort of a feedback loop. Now this theory has been applied in virtually dozens of different behavioral domains. There are now well over a thousand empirical studies that have been uh, published. And if you're interested, you can go to my, my website and that. A long list of references uh, of empirical papers that have used the theory. Uh, we've currently been been working on a meta-analysis of the uh, effects that you get of the relationships uh, specified in the model. There have been a number of meta-analyses published in the past. What is unique about this one is that we're using structural equation modeling to uh, do this meta-analysis. Now, as I said, there's over a thousand studies. We didn't try to include all of these studies in the meta-analysis. We took a subsample, and uh, here is the result. Um, the attitude and tension relationship, this is the observed effect size. But more interesting is this column here, which uh, corrects for attenuation due to unreliability. And you can see that these effect sizes are pretty strong, even when it comes to the intention-behavior correlation, which, as I said before, can be problematic. People don't all, always act on their intention. Even there, we get a strong, uh, a large effect size. What is also interesting, though, is that the, these effect sizes vary greatly across studies. In some studies, you get a small effect, in some you get a very large effect. And the... Um, so the, the Q statistic is, an, is a measure of this heterogeneity of findings. And that is statistically highly significant. So what that means is that if the study is carefully conducted, the measures are well developed, 
you get good correlations among these variables. But if the study is less uh, well planned, then the results might not be so uh, encouraging. Um, but overall, on the average, uh, the model is doing quite well. And here we get the a structural equation model using these da da data. These are the average um, correlations fed into the model. You see we have, account for 37% of the variance in intentions with all three factors making a significant contribution. And we account for 26% of the variance in behavior where the intention is the better of the two predictors. Again, you can get much stronger effects uh, depending on how well the study was conducted. Now, let's move to behavior change interventions. So, what, so far what I've shown you is that the theory holds quite well in terms of the predictions that it makes. We can use it to predict intentions, we can use it to predict behavior, but what uh, do we do if we want to change behavior? Now, the, the model can be used in, in a number of ways. One is to uh, motivate people to engage in the behavior. So that means that um, we find out that people don't perform the behavior because they don't intend to do so. They simply don't, not interested. Then we have to motivate them to do it. Right? So we have to get them to the point where they intend to do it. So that's one way in which we can use the theory. Find out what motivates people, what kinds of beliefs do they have, what attitudes do they hold, and then we decide how to change those to motivate them to engage in the behavior. Um, another situation is one where people are already motivated, they already hold the intention, but they don't carry it out, or many of them don't carry it out. That's the, an example with the smokers that I mentioned before. In that case, the problem is not so much of motivating them, they're already motivated, but helping them to carry out their intentions. And a third way in which the model has been used is if you design an intervention, not on the basis of the theory of blind behavior, you design it on some other basis, maybe just intuitively, but you want to find out how it works or doesn't work. You can measure the constructs in the theory and see how your intervention influenced them. It gives you some ideas about how to improve the intervention if it doesn't work very well. Okay, so, as I said before, many interventions don't go through a lot of planning. The theory of planned behavior, though, provides you with guidelines to what one would have to do in terms of formative research before you actually uh, design the intervention and to make sure that the intervention will be effective. So you start out by defining your behavior. People don't perform the behavior, you want to, you want to get them to perform it. So the next thing is you look at the intention. Do they already intend to perform the behavior? If so, then you have to help them carry it out. If they don't perform, don't, don't hold the intention, then it's probably maybe a question of con control, that they don't have sufficient control over the behavior. And we would have to help them uh, acquire the skills or whatever it is that, 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 that they're lacking. Let's assume we, were, we decide that the intention is not strong enough, we need to strengthen the intention. So we have to look at the, the next step. Um, to what extent do attitudes, subjective norms, perceived control influence these intentions? Can we predict the intentions from these three factors? And which of the three factors is the most important contributor to the intention? And then we go to the next level and say, all right, so if we wanted to change attitudes, for example, we would f have to find out about the beliefs that people hold, about the likely consequences of the behavior. If we want to change the subjective norm, we have to find out about normative beliefs. What do they think others who are important in their lives uh, think they should do? And if it's, uh, we want to change perceived control, then we have to look at these control beliefs. 
And there's a methodology that has been developed uh, to obtain measures of all of these things. We can measure intentions, we can measure attitudes, subjective norms, perceived control. We can elicit beliefs to get some description, a picture of what people believe about the behavior. And then finally, let's say we have decided now that there are certain kinds of beliefs that we are going to target. So we either try to change some of the existing, existing beliefs, or maybe we decide we want to introduce new information so people will form new beliefs. We now have a set of beliefs that we would like to change. We have to design an intervention that will be targeted those particular beliefs. And then we have to do another pilot study in which we find out whether the intervention actually does change those beliefs that we have targeted. In other words, there's a lot of work involved if you want to be sure that uh, you're going to have an effective intervention. Right. Um, not only that, you can see here that there's a chain of effects. And these, car these associations here, these links, are not perfect. Right. They don't have correlations of one. So there's some slippage as you go from one level to the next. And if you have a change, if you have an intervention here, you change some of the beliefs, uh, the change in attitude may be much less than the change in beliefs because the association is not perfect. And the change in attitude may produce even a smaller change in intention, and the change in intention may produce an even smaller change in behavior. And so we need to have an intervention that really is powerful, changing a lot of these beliefs if we want it to carry through all the way to behavior. Um, I'd like to illustrate the importance of targeting the right kinds of beliefs and attitudes. And the example I'm going to show you, this is an old study, but I think it's still the best illustration of that point. This was, uh, the study was done before I developed the theory of planned behavior. It used the theory of reasoned action, which doesn't have the control element in it. Now, the, the study was done in a um, VA hospital. The um, veterans would come in with complaining of all kinds of health issues, but they were identified as, uh, the, these health issues were identified as being secondary to alcoholism. These were people who had an alcohol problem. So they were hospitalized, and while they were in the hospital, they were told that, the, that there was a new unit that had been established in the hospital, an alcohol treatment unit, and they were encouraged to join the unit. Uh, so before any intervention, we obtained some measures of their uh, attitudes and subjective norms with respect to joining this unit, as well as the intention to join the unit, and some initial indication of whether they would uh, likely to do this. Um, they weren't committing themselves yet. And um, what you can see is that we accounted for quite a bit of the variance in the intention, 53% of the variance in intentions. Attitudes were, were the more important predictor. And 58% uh, of the variance in, in this initial indication of behavior. So we decided to try to change their attitudes to make their, you know, strengthen their intentions to join this unit. Uh, the intervention consisted of a 15-minute speech given by the director of this alcohol treatment unit. In that 15-minute speech, the director made 10 arguments. In other words, we were trying to change 10 specific beliefs. Okay. Uh, so each argument was presented, and then there was some supportive supporting evidence, and it took 15 minutes for this to do. So the subjects were brought into, the, into a room in small groups, and the director came in and gave the speech. Now, there's a what I call a traditional threat appeal. This was basically telling people, if you continue to drink alcohol, you're refusing to face reality, you're losing opportunity to solving your basic problem, you will, will ruin, it will lead to ruined physical and mental health, it will lead to a poor relation with family, and so on. terrible things are going to happen if you continue to drink. And while you're in the hospital, there's another uh, con five consequences. 
There will be less personal attention, uh, less help with your personal problems, less self-government, and so on. So ten negative consequences if you continue to drink. Okay. Then they were given the opportunity to actually sign up. Now they were committing themselves. And this was not a, a, a trivial matter. It was a, a six-week program, and they would be, uh, you know, they wouldn't be able to work if they had a job. Um, they would be separate from their families and so on. So it was a major commitment. So they were told, so the, joining the alcohol treatment unit will give you the opportunity to solve your drinking problem. Therefore, I urge you to sign up for the ATU now. <coughs> and what was the effect of the threat appeal? There was a no message control group. In that group, almost 50% signed uh, to, and, and joined the unit. In the uh, threat appeal, 29% did. Now, if it's sort of a boomerang effect, it was actually counterproductive. Now, why did that happen? Well, if you think about it, what was the behavior that we were trying to change? We were trying to get them to join the alcohol treatment unit. But what was the behavior that was addressed in this message? It was continue to drink alcohol. That's two different behaviors. Continue to drink is one behavior, and joining this alcohol treatment unit is a different behavior. Now, why the, why the uh, boomerang effect? Well, I think what may have happened here is, you know, they were told about this alcohol treatment unit, they were given some hope that maybe this would be something useful. And then they're told, you know what, if you continue to drink, all these terrible things are going to happen. They thought, I know that. You know, I've been here before. I've been told by my, my employer. I've been told by my wife. I've been told by everybody that I should stop drinking. So that's what you're going to do in this alcohol treatment unit? I, I have no interest in it. So not only was there nothing new, it was basically telling them it's not worth it. But we had another condition, in which I called a negative appeal. Here, they were told, if you do not sign up for the alcohol treatment unit, then all these terrible things are going to happen. Same ten arguments, but now in relation to the behavior that we were interested in. And therefore, you should sign up now. One thing to look at, then, is what happened to the beliefs that people held in relation to these ten outcomes? Do they think that these outcomes would happen, yes or no? With agreement on a 10-point scale, I believe. In the um, threat appeal, the traditional threat appeal, actually people were less likely to believe that these things would happen, um, whereas, uh, the, uh, whereas in the uh, negative appeal, they were much more likely to believe. In other words, these people believe if I don't join, join this unit, it's, it's going to be really bad. These people said, if I don't join this unit, it's not going to be bad at all, because this unit is really worthless. Now, if you look at the attitude towards signing up, which is the relevant attitude in this case, here's your control group. Again, in the threat appeal, attitudes became more negative towards signing up, whereas in the, in the negative appeal, they became more positive. And then finally, when you look at behavior, this is what you saw before, the boomerang effect, but now in the negative appeal condition, 63% signed up. So now we have a, um, you know, if, we, if we change the right kinds of beliefs and attitudes, we get a change in the behavior in the desired direction. But in this case, when we changed the wrong attitude, not only didn't it work, it actually had a boomerang effect. Okay, I'll, I'll take a few more minutes just to uh, give you some uh, idea of how well the theory works and interventions, and then I hope we'll have some time for question and answers. Um, we just finished a paper in which we did another meta-analysis, this time on uh, behavior change interventions using the theory of planned behavior. So we looked at interventions that try to change behavioral beliefs, trying to change normative beliefs, control beliefs, added, and so on, all each of the constructs in the model. Now, in many, in many of these interventions, they don't measure beliefs, so there are relatively small number of studies that actually measured the beliefs. 
There are many more studies that measured attitudes, subjective norms and perceived control, and studies that measure intentions, and then also quite a few studies that actually they looked at behavior. And these are the effect sizes, all significant except for the behavioral beliefs here, and of uh, fair, fairly strong effects, but then again you have huge uh, variability across studies. Okay, so some interventions are much more effective than others. And it has to do with how well the intervention was designed and what kind of behavior they're trying to change. I mean, some behaviors are easier to change than others. Um, so you get a range. Uh, but overall, on average, it works quite well. And this is a, a paper that just came out, a meta-analysis by Sheeran and his associates, where they did something similar. They looked at all the studies they could find that had attempted to change uh, attitudes, subjective norms, or perceived behavioral control or self-efficacy. And then they said if, they, if, those, if those targets were changed, how much of a change in intention do you get? And how much of a change in behavior do you get? And here are the results. If you change attitudes, here are the effect sizes. And you can see they're quite strong effects. So if you manage to change attitudes, you also manage to change behavior, intentions and you also manage to change behavior, and the same for norms and control. Again, with, some, with quite a bit of variability across studies. So just to illustrate the kinds of data that you get, the kind of, uh, just, just uh, look at some concrete examples. This was a study done early by Murphy and Brubecker on testicular self-examinations at 10th grade students in health classes. The um, behavior was uh, testicular self-examinations. Uh, so they were followed up in a four-week period, and they were asked whether they had performed this uh, procedure. The intervention consisted uh, of a persuasive communication, and there were three conditions in the experiment. One was a theory of planned behavior-based communication, which uh, sort of was a videotaped message that was designed to strengthen these three components towards performing uh, TSE. There was a cancer information condition, which is just telling people you know, about testicular cancer and other kinds of cancers. And then a health information control group that they just got a pamphlet about health issues. Uh, here you can see the attitude, change in attitude and the change in intention. The um, subjective norms and perceived control didn't, there was no, no major effect, but you had a big change in attitude and intention, and you can see that con compared to the control group, cancer information produced some change, and the theory of planned behavior intervention produced a larger change. And these are the, the behaviors in the control group. About 6% said that they had performed this uh, test. In the cancer information group, 23%. And in the theory of plant behavior group, 42%. So again, when you have a, a theory-based uh, intervention, it does seem to make a difference. This is a study that I was involved in as a, as a consultant. Um, these were uh, adults with an alcohol problem. Uh, they were uh, called up, and there was a session, 45 to 50 minute telephone session, which tried to change their control beliefs in relation to, to joining an alcohol treatment program. Control issues are very often important because in, you know, they, they, they do know that they have an alcohol problem, so they do want to take care of the problem, that, that they're motivated, but the issue is that they find it very difficult to abstain from alcohol. So, uh, or, or to join the program would also be difficult for them because it, it involves a major commitment. So, um, there was a control group where they just read a pamphlet about the dangers of alcohol abuse. In the study, they assessed the behavioral normative and control beliefs as well as intentions before the intervention and then again after the intervention. And then finally, uh, three months later, there was a follow-up to see if they had joined an alcohol treatment program. 
and here are the results. You can see behavioral beliefs didn't change, normative beliefs didn't change, but they were not addressed in this intervention. The intervention only targeted control beliefs, and they did change. They became more positive. The intentions became more positive, and joining the, the treatment uh, went up from 12% in the control group to 31% in the intervention group. And I think this is the last one I want to show you. Here we have old patients, elderly. Um, they reported on their eating habits, whether they ate a, a healthy diet. Um, and then, so there was a pretest where they reported this, and then two week follow up. And the intervention was a booklet that was based on the theory of plant behavior, and again, it targeted mainly perceived control issues in relation to healthy eating, and there was a control group that just filled out a patient satisfaction survey. You can see that perceived control did in fact change. This is the control group, this is the intervention group. Intentions became more favorable, and this is the self-reported behavior to the extent to which they ate a healthy diet. So we, we can change people's behavior if we address the right, if we have a good understanding of what, what motivates the behavior, uh, why the people perform or don't perform it, and then address the relevant variables to, to change it. So uh, in conclusion, I'd say that the theory of plant behavior is a good model for predicting and explaining intentions. You know, we have a, we get a pretty good understanding why people intend to do something, or not if we measure all the underlying uh, constructs. The, um, when you go from intentions to behavior, we do have some issues. I mean, people don't always carry out their intentions, their issues of control. The other things I haven't talked about, um, there may be new information becoming available, people change their intentions. There are all kinds of reasons why intentions don't necessarily result in behavior. Um, and when it comes to behavior change, it involves a series of steps, as I've tried to show. And if you change the appropriately selected beliefs, that will produce ultimately a change in intentions. And if you have a strong intention-behavior relation, then that will also result in a change in behavior. So thank you for your attention.